think we all value our environment. And it's important to recognize that. But we also all value something different. Our preferences are all different. Some of you may prefer to live in the urban environment. Some of you may take, make the choice to live in a rural environment. Some of you may go in the weekend to the Veluwe. Some of you may go to the coast. And some of you may even come to the surroundings of Heerle and walk here through the hilly landscape. As a kid, I drove through the Netherlands with my parents in the car or by train. And later on, I went with my brother on a bike through the Netherlands. And I started to appreciate all these various landscapes of the Netherlands. And let's be honest, it gives us a huge opportunity and perhaps an advantage. Perhaps there is a good place for all of you in the Netherlands. I also started to notice how this landscape is changing over time. And in my lifetime, I saw, well, the finalization of the Dutch polders, the urbanization going on, the increased infrastructure that we started to develop. And these are all changes that are fantastic, but are also, if you go further back, and I show you here a picture of my office at home, with a couple of these old maps, and they are unique snapshots over time, of like 200, 300 years ago. And we have to realize that over all those years, all these changes took place. But what was the starting point? The starting point of the Netherlands was that it was a rather uninhabitable place. It was a terrible place to live. And let's be honest, through all these changes, building the dikes, draining the swamps, getting rid of the peat areas in the Netherlands, we make it a beautiful, livable, habitable place. And we proudly give often the example that the Netherlands, uh, how the Dutch created the Netherlands. And we are famous for that. And if we go and look a little bit in more detail at the map, this is an old map, of 1972, or sorry, 1792, it's a lot older. Um, and in this map, you can already see that a lot of the peat areas around the pale, they already disappeared. You can also see that on the Veluwe, that there's like a lot of these cover sands were highly degraded and they were exposed. It's a degraded landscape. And they're often, if you go to the Veluwe, we're often talking about the desert areas of the Netherlands. So it's rather extreme, and many of these changes are on purpose and desired. But we also have to realize that there are also negative changes taking place. There's contamination, there's degradation going on, there's pollution. And there's a lot of things there in between. There's a big gray area. For example, if we take the Veluwe, it's a degraded landscape. And for me, as a soul scientist, I could say, well, it hurts me that this area is degraded. But others go as a touristic outing to the Veluwe to enjoy the beautiful surrounding. And this is also true for a lot of the header areas in the Netherlands. But at the end of the day, there are many questions that are being posed in the daily news and in our political debate about preserving landscapes, conserving, restoring and developing these landscapes. And how are we going to do that? The main question that we are facing as a society is what we would like to conserve and preserve. And in this discussion, we also weigh the consequences to this desire of conservation. Just to give you an example, if you would be walking through the streets this morning or biking and you would see a wolf crossing the road or a badger, perhaps seeing a beaver in, in a water pond, I guess you would be really enthusiastic and I'm sure you would tell your friends tonight or your family that you have seen these animals. But of course it becomes a completely different story. As soon as the sheep are killed by the wolf, the trains do not run, because of the badger, or historic trees are being felled by the beavers. 
it becomes a completely different story. It is clear that choices have to be made about our environment. What are we aiming for, for the future? What would we like to conserve? It's an almost impossible debate with many subjective choices. And where are we going back in history? Are we going to conserve the landscapes of last century? Are we going back to the uninhabitable landscape of millennia ago? Probably not. I strongly feel that we have to look at our environment in a different way. We have to focus perhaps not on what was there, but perhaps look more on the future. What are the characteristics of a future livable environment that we all would like to have? And to a certain extent, despite the earlier discussion, we may really agree upon that. We probably would like to have a safe environment where there is not serious flooding, where there are no earthquakes, where there, are, where there is no pollution. But we also want a productive area where there's energy being produced, where there's food being produced, where we have safe drinking water. And we would like to have a safe environment, or sorry, a space in our environment to live and to recreate in the weekends. So if you look at those kind of characteristics, we would call them in environmental science the ecosystem services. And it may well be that if we look at these ecosystem services, that we really agree upon a lot of them. That does not mean that we are going to discard the elements of biodiversity and cultural heritage, because they are also part of that livable environment. They are part of some of these ecosystem services. But the target that we are aiming for is a very different one. But let's be honest. By just defining a livable environment and the discussions that we can have around that, if we get to that target, the discussion does not end. There is still a major question. How do we get there? How do we make the shift to this environment? And we're constantly being faced by those questions. And then there's also the not in my backyard and position. And when we talk about energy that we are using, all of us, we are using it. But as soon as there is a solar farm in your, next to your house or a wind farm close to your house, we all start to complain. We would like to have the energy, but we don't want the solar or the wind farms. Similarly, last week, our national airline reported record high profits because I guess we all like to take the plane again to our holiday destinations or sometimes work meetings. But as soon as our national airport starts to change the flight paths over the Netherlands, there is a huge opposition against these changes. Again, we would like to fly, but at the same time we don't want to have these uh, negative elements. So how do I, as an environmental scientist, try to make the shift? First of all, we have to realize that we have to understand the system. And that is, has become true in, in the past, in the Netherlands. Just take the example of the polder I was already referring to. When the first polders were established, quite quick, fast after the establishment of the polders, we discovered that on the mainland, bordering the polder, there were severe problems with droughts. And just by understanding the system better, we learned that we should have a water body in between the polder and the mainland to discouple or disconnect those two hydrological systems. And that was actually play found place when we started creating the flavor polder at the next polders. But sometimes we also see that 
the long-term effects are simply not known. Take the example of gas exploitation in Groningen. Or we could also look closer to, our, to Heerle with the mines. Eh? We started the mines, we started the gas exploitation, but nobody ever had foreseen these long-term consequences that we were experiencing now. And perhaps not an example from environmental science, but think about the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we had serious problems, but there was simply, there was a disease coming in, we had to take interventions, but there was no time to really understand the system, how it was working. And that, of course, challenged us then, but it also challenges nowadays with diseases in agricultural systems, but also with floodings and the change in climate that is imposed on us. Secondly, we have to identify the options, the pathways that we can make those changes. And sometimes it's not even identifying what, uh, what is a potential pathway, but it is also very much identifying what is not possible. If I would tell you that you would like to have a 0% chance on flooding in the Netherlands, I can tell you that can be a very nice objective, but it's very unlikely that we will ever reach a 0% probability of flooding in the Netherlands. But we also see a lot of greenwashing going on. Options that are provided. Here, this was a sign at the Dutch railways, I saw it on the platform, where it said, well it said in Dutch, but in English here, every year we make 2,500 to 5,000 square meters around our train stations greener and more biodiverse. And at first you think, wow, you know, they're really doing something. They are really trying to make the change. And my like, modeling background shows me, hmm, we have 400 train stations in the Netherlands, roughly. An average of five platforms per train station. That is 2,000 platforms in the Netherlands. So basically this means they're going to put one or two planters on each of the platforms in the Netherlands. How serious is the contribution? And finally, there is the element of communication. As an environmental scientist, we can think about the understanding of the system, we can find certain pathways, but at the end of the day, we have to contribute to the public debate and the informed decision making, to really support that discussion with everybody and identify what are the options, what are the targets that we can set, what are realistic ones, but also what are the pathways that are realistic. And through the understanding of the system and possible actions and communicating about the consequences, I as an environmental scientist try to make the shift. So in conclusion, are we aiming for the wrong target? I would like to argue that shooting backwards is always a bad idea. Let us concentrate on the future on a livable environment. We need to make the shift from environmental conservation to a livable environment. And this debate should really focus on defining the livable environment through selected pathways, through selected um, ecosystem services. And that is a challenge that we are facing together to create a livable environment for all of us, for you as a scientist, for you as a policymaker, and for you as a citizen. Thank you.